welcome to our show, Boops for Your Pooches, where we talk about favorite way that you like to pet your cat or dog. Um, Kelly, do you want to come on out and we'll discuss that for a minute? Um, personally, I like to roll them on their bellies a little bit and then like get in between their little toe beans with my fingers and just like give them like little rubs on their feet because they're on their feet all day and it probably gets real sore. What's your Absolutely. favorite way to pet your cat or dog? Well, Nicole, I'll say this. I know you're rolling with what you're talking about here, but I did forget to play my intro music. So oh. uh, I'm just going to back out and uh, you go ahead and you just introduce me again. Okay, okay bye. Um, all right, Kelly, uh, let's bring out our my co-host, Kelly, so that we can talk about his favorite way to pet his animals. Come on out, Kelly. <laughs> Yeah, see, I spent a good like 20 minutes making that logo spin. <laughs> and uh, I'm, you know, the, I'm a little bit proud spin of it. was new, so. wasn't it? That was nice. This is new. And everything that is actually now an appropriate volume, which is why your ears weren't blasted out by the intro music. And uh, we're really moving up in the world here, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and you said, so I want to be clear. What, what did you call the show tonight? Uh, boops for your pooches. Okay, boops with the unvoiced P at the end. That's that's a good clarification. I thought you were going in a very different direction. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, and it's not about breastfeeding your pets. It's mm. definitely about giving them all the cuddles. Okay. <laughs> so you're asking what my favorite way to, to boop pooches is? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I used to have uh, a uh, extremely gigantic uh, horse-sized... Uh, dog and uh, he he was like completely hyperactive and destroyed everything and that's kind of why he got rehomed but anyway uh, the one time he was chill was when it came time for bed and he actually put himself to bed which I being the kind of um, weirdo who didn't like his dog being in the cage um, let him sleep in my bed with me which it was great because uh, you like this was a dog who was big enough that you could just literally spoon with him, mm -hmm. um, which was nice because that's the majority of who occupied my bed with me during that time. <laughs> and he would also, but he would like I had a you know normal size queen size bed, and he would come and lay directly in the middle of it. And so you know he was he, like he was not a dog of boops you know that applies a certain like gentleness and like easiness to move mm -hmm. it, it was sort of like in order to snuggle with this dog uh and not be falling off the edge of my bed i would have to like drag his 90 pounds of dead weight <laughs> sideways on the bed just to get room for myself and he would look at me like why are you messing with me during my sleep in my bed uh and it was great and uh yeah he would boot me and by that i mean uh wake me up when in, he was ready to wake up by walking on my face, uh, <laughs> which honestly is the most effective alarm clock I've ever owned. Um, yeah, but he really liked to punch people in the dick. So it was <laughs> a dog of contrast. He contained multitudes. That's, uh, he reminds me of my aunt's dog who I dog sit for sometimes. I think you've met him. Um, his name is Racky and he is also likes to sleep in the bed with me. He's, um, he's not allowed to sleep in the bed with his um with my aunt or like any of her family um but i'm weak um and he also likes to sleep in the middle of the bed but he likes to be little spoon and he likes to be under the covers um so he will like if you don't lift up the covers and let him like under so that he can curl up into your stomach then he will like just nose the covers off the end of the bed until you have none of them mm -hmm. um so yeah Similar vibes. He's very uh, not not a super um, considerate cuddler, but certainly a certain a very aggressive one. Hmm. I mean, what what is not the best kind of cuddling, but aggressive cuddling? Like it's a perfect <laughs> vibe. It's he, he like he had definitely like kind of top vibes for how much he liked to be Little Spoon. He was very he was very he was a very dominant Little Spoon. 
Hmm. Mm. Uh, oh boy. Uh, wonderful to hear that uh, both our listeners on YouTube and Twitch cannot hear us. So oh. uh, if Nicole, if you could just uh, move forward by miming, that would be great. Uh, unless our current Twitch viewer wants to hop in the comments and let us know whether they can hear or not, or whether this is purely a page issue. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I feel you. Hmm, all right. Go on. Yeah. I guess it doesn't help if I'm not miming my responses, but... I don't know. I was just doing the airplane things. All right. Airplane well, safety is super important. And speaking of landing planes, I think it's time that we can land a good segue. Because uh, <laughs> I do I do have something I want to talk about tonight. And it is, of course, the... Uh, oh, good. It's a page issue. Well, that's typical. So we'll move on. <laughs> um yeah, I've been I've been going through this a lot lately um, when communicating with people because I don't know which emoji heart to use, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of wondering if we can solve this taxonomy with some help from our friends here. Uh, so, sure. Should we bring out our guest for the night, and she can help us work this out? Uh, you know, I was. I was thinking we, you know, should try to solve it by ourselves before we ask for help, but she has been waiting patiently for a long time and presumably has way more important stuff to talk about than we do. So um, I, all I will ask, Nicole, is that you spend about 10 seconds uh, stalling here while I go ahead and uh, find our guest intro. Okay. Um... No, never mind. I found it. Do you want to let, let me introduce her before we? That's a pretty great video. Yeah, I'm, this one took me about longer. <laughs> All right, hello and welcome to Giselle General. Um, she is a city council candidate for the upcoming Edmonton election and a draft onesie enthusiast. Um, before we get into Kelly's thing, I want to know, Giselle, what is your favorite way to pet your pet a cat and or dog? What's interesting is, um, like in my house here, we've never had our own like pets, but we have roommates downstairs mm -hmm. in our basement suite with pets. So we are more like the slightly more hands off cat auntie and uncle that mm -hmm. will say hello while our roommates are about to take the pets out for a walk. Um, and when we have pets sit with our friends, uh, my husband is a very good um, cat bed. So he would be lying on the couch, playing video games for hours, and then the cat would be like on his chest. While <laughs> I'm like the, the slightly like, distant but loving auntie. So like, hey, I won't interrupt you because your, your uncle, my dear husband, is being a cat bed. So I'll let you be. So that's more of my style. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's like having yeah a partner that's really good with kids, and you're like, good for you, and like you still get to like babysit and stuff, but you're like, you go do your thing over there. I'm just gonna be over here making snacks. That's right. <laughs> that's yeah. nice. I'm wondering if we can dig into this distant but loving uh, anti idea. Like, Jessa, what's your, what's your kind of vision of um, uh, uh, of distant but loving? Like, is it, is it sort of something where you're like, uh, you know, like you, you, you're completely genuine and emotionally available, but like just physically distant, like you're only supportive from across the room? Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, like making sure that um, I guess I guess my husband and I would be as a team, like make sure like the water is refilled and food is there and whatnot. And I guess I'm more of also like more of like a verbal, you know, like, hey, button. Mm -hmm. How are you enjoying your uncle over there? <laughs> and um, and and if, if and well, we have actually pet sit up uh, two of our friends' cats, uh, Button and uh, Pippin are their names. They're both uh, black cats, super adorable. But um, yeah, I would more like greet them and stuff like that, and make sure their basics are met. So that's more, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> All right. So where were we at with the with the emoji hearts? Oh, we had not yet started. Hmm. Hmm. That's, that's, uh, you know, it's as good a place as any to start. Mm -hmm. So. 
Let me just start on. Let me just bring up the emoji hearts and see what the different ones are. And, I was I was really proud of myself for having them all loaded up before we started the show in Discord. And now every time I try and talk to Paige about her tech problems, then I keeps losing it. But we're back. Okay. So first and foremost, we got the red heart, which I mean, I could be wrong. I feel like this is a genuine expression of love. Like, hey, I love you. Is, is this a controversial opinion? I mean, I, f I feel like that's, yeah, that's pretty basic. Although, like, I, how are you differentiating that from the other colors of hearts? Well, this is what we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. So if this is our baseline, w what am I telling someone when I send them the orange heart? Uh, I mean... Yeah, I don't know. How much do you love orange? Because I've been told that the yellow heart is like, hey, on the down low, we're just friends. Like, is this is so this a commonly like held like belief? The, I mean, that's oh, so that that kind of like goes back to that like roses thing, right? I guess maybe that's maybe how we can like gauge this is like if you if someone gets you red roses, that's like kind of more romantic love. Where it's like, I know my dad has got me like yellow roses before for Valentine's Day as like a platonic, like, here you go. It's roses and it's nice and it's cute, but it's like, weirdly needs to overstate that it's platonic. Does like, is there more than, is there like, a, do the roses have meanings for more than two colors or is it just like a red yellow dichotomy? Um, I don't know, actually. I've never had, I've never, I don't think, received roses of any other color. That's not true. I got blue roses, but I got them from my mom. So I'm assuming that was also platonic, though I can't speak for her on that. Hmm. Okay. So here's, here's my pitch for the team here. Is if the orange heart is a pretty much a middle point between a red heart and a yellow car, heart on the, on the color spectrum, and red is I love you and yellow is let's just be pals. Is orange kind of the friends with benefits heart? Is that what I'm getting out of this? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm down with that. Like, you know, if you say like, hey, you want, uh, love to have you over tonight, orange heart, it's like, love you have to have you over tonight, but I better not see you in the morning. Like, maybe that's sort of, maybe that's sort of what's coded into it. I don't know, Giselle, what do you think? So basically, you, you, when you decode it, it's like Netflix and chill. <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Orange, you glad they didn't send you a yellow heart? <laughs> Orange, I glad you didn't make that. Oh, you did. Hmm. <laughs> oh. Okay, so now we've got the green heart. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Giselle, you got a green heart in your text message. What's your first reaction? And it's not St. Patrick's Day. You got a green heart. What, what's your reaction? Um... For some reason, the first word that came up in my mind is solidarity. Like, I think I would, I can, you know, on my Twitter and whatnot, I can totally see it. Um, it's not even through text messaging, most likely through Twitter, like talking about like a political topic uh, and whatnot. And I can actually see some kind people, you know, putting a, as a comment, a, a green heart, just like a sign of like empathy or like, yeah, I hear you. So, yeah. Yeah. Not sure if there's like, like logic to that, but that's what came to mind. Okay, so now you're not less, you, not necessarily you don't necessarily know this person, but they're saying like, "Hey, I, I feel that feeling," or "I know what you're talking about," or "Okay, yeah, I can get behind that." Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make a note of that. I feel like I can use that. Mm -hmm. So we have one data point here for the blue heart, which is that Nicole got one from her mom. So I'm wondering if it helps to notice what kind of relationship Nicole has with her mom. Like, is it healthy? Uh, I don't know. Are you my therapist? <laughs> I mean, some days, some episodes of this show, it feels like it. Mm, that's fair. Uh, yeah, I think we have a pretty good relationship. Um, yeah, I like call her a few times a week. We chat an appropriate amount. We lived together for like three years in my t late 20s, which some people may find weird, but... I found was actually quite refreshing. So what you're saying is it's possible that the blue heart is the like, I love you, but you got to move out of my house heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of like a bruised heart, like, like a cool heart. Like, I love you, but like, 
the intensity of this relationship is chilled for me. Yeah. And I need like, <laughs> that's the uh I think as Giselle put it, the uh like affectionate but distant heart. Mm-hmm. Like I would like to love you from further away. I feel like that tracks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then the purple heart goes with a saying, as we all know, I love you and also I've been wounded in combat and service of the US military. So that's I mean, that's right over the plate. I don't think there's any question of that. Mm-hmm. I don't know, unless there's other uses you've seen it for. Mm. <clears throat> I did see it once for um Oh, gosh. This joke is going to be a lot funnier if I can remember the name of the character. What's that purple guy from the McDonald's Grimace? troop? Grimace. Grimace. Yeah, specifically for people that, like, really love Grimace. Like, big fans. Or, like, I love you the way Grimace loves... Does Grimace love hamburgers? I'm not even sure. I, th- I seem to remember his thing being chicken nuggets, but I'm not... I might just be making that up because he's kind of shaped like a chicken nugget. Hmm. Now, as we're talking about this, I do remember that I did promise Giselle no pop culture references. Uh, and we're, we've already blown that promise. Well, I mean, if it's international enough, then maybe it's okay. Like, I did I did have McDonald's where I immigrated from, so... Well, I yeah, but did, 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 Grim, did Grimace make it to the Philippines? Actually, yes. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, like... I mean, I I lived in a small mining village in the Philippines, so I w- the only time I would see McDonald's and the characters is when we go to the city. But yes, that uh, you know, purple figure is uh, pretty familiar. But for for kids in the Philippines, like our attention is split because there is a comparable um, uh, fast food franchise as well, and they also have characters. So we have to think about like, is this from McDonald's or is this from Jollibee? But uh, but I, I do recognize the character. Is that, sorry, that's Jollibee? Yeah. And do they have a purple character? No, they don't. Hmm. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of like the the, the filters. Like, oh, yes, um, purple McDonald's. Maybe that's why they haven't made it big internationally. Is they just don't have a purple character to sell their brand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They made it, they were pretty big in uh, Calgary. They opened one up and there was a lineup around the block, apparently, when it opened up. They... And I think the first like three or five people got like a year's year of free Jollibee. Yep. It was like a whole Wait, big real? thing. Yeah. Do they, do they have it in Edmonton? They have uh, four right now or three. Okay. I feel like yep. I've never seen one. Well, then, okay, clearly they have made it internationally and I'm just uh, the fool here. Hmm. So, uh, okay. So I guess the real question here is, do we believe Grimace is a creature capable of love? I mean, how do we this define is, how are we defining love in this situation? I mean, this is a thing I don't know, and this is a thing I expect my city councilors to be able to define for me. So, <laughs> can you define this abstract concept concept for us, please? Yeah, can mm-hmm. I, I want you to? I, I want all of my councilors, um, especially the ones I'm not capable of voting for because I live in a different ward, to be able to walk into those council chambers, sit down flop down their big, cool, heavy, like, leather folder of files and opinions and be able to just state firmly, this is my belief as to whether or not the character Grimace is capable of love. (laughs) Is that so much to ask? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. It'll be interesting which um, committee um, will that uh, fall under, you know, because there's, like, city council with, like, everybody and there's, like, actual different committees. So, yeah, I I wonder where, like, which part of, which agenda item for which meeting will that fall under? I mean, if you're bold enough, that's going to be agenda item one on day one. You know, Ooh. this is the power you'll be vested with. <laughs> so um, I guess we could, we should, I, sh- I didn't introduce um, which ward you're running for, but you're running for CP Winnie Walk. Am I, did that's I say correct. that right? Did I, is that yeah. okay? Mm-hmm. Cool. And um, for context for people, because they reference um, former like boundaries also, which is totally cool. It is all of the former Ward 5 plus six neighborhoods of the former Ward 1 around here, around 87th Avenue. Yeah, it's really interesting how boundaries have been changed and merged. Like actually, um, I guess Ward Dene um, has been left out unscathed. So, you know, Ward 4, Ward Dene, it's all intact. And for mine, it's just two wards kind of combined together. But there are some wards where it's like little bits of like 
between four and five different uh, former wards, which is um, a bit confusing for, for the people there. So they they have to do a lot of education, the candidates, I mean. Yeah. I, I do appreciate your use of the words like unscathed and intact, which sort of implies that like the redrawing of the ward boundaries has been a very destructive process. <laughs> yeah. It's been real like, violent. Families like split up by being across the street and they're looking at each other longingly through a chain link fence. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't realize it would be happening. And yeah. yeah, you must have been away that weekend, but it was rough. There was blood and shrapnel everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's you know what it's it's all in the name of uh you know people having to go and remember which ward they live in and that's I guess that's a positive step it was worth it was worth all the deaths of the reboundering Um so Giselle you were talking about learning um how to pronounce the new names of the wards um and I we, we uh, I kind of wanted to show that off a little bit because you it sounded like you really had them down. So what was the you you said you started with the hardest one? What was the what was the hardest one that you said about, you memorized? So the hardest one, which is the one that is a little bit of the former Ward Ten, of course, there's a bit some boundary changes there. So that's um, Ipiko Kanipiotsi. Um, I think to spelling wise, it's like twenty letters or whatever. It means oh. land of the thunderbirds, if I'm not mistaken. It sounds like a lovely name. Uh, yeah, so I started with that. So you know, um, Epiko Kanipiotsi, um, CP Winnewak actually is also kind of like middle of the ground for difficulty. Um, with Ward O Damon, it's actually not the spelling that I mean the pronunciation that confuses me. It's the spelling because it has an apostrophe and a dash in you know in every syllable. So I'm like, where do you put the dash? Where do you put the apostrophe? I get confused. Um, yeah, so um, Pihesuin is fine, and um, you know Anungnuk is fine because I have um, you know like the the syllable. Um, there's a uh, comparable in the Philippine culture, so that's cool. And then you know the easier like, Nakoda Iska, very straightforward and same with um, Ward Meiti and Dene, you know, that's the easier ones um, on the um, end of the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. That's so yeah. cool. Uh, I mean, I think that if, if this helps with Odaemon, that if you try to remember which one has a hyphen, and which one has an apostrophe, you can just remember that if the apostrophe was first uh, and the hyphen was second, it would look like uh, a war named after an Irish person named Oday and also the minimum amount of it. So as soon as you realize that's incorrect, you can just switch them around. Ah, okay. Sounds great. So did you want to, uh, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to show off and pronounce all of them correctly? Yeah, for sure. So, and actually I, I posted a few videos of that on Twitter uh, a while back just to encourage um, people to learn how to pronounce it. But um, yeah, so from the top, it would be, you know, Nakoda Iska, Anang Nuk, Tasta Winnewak, uh, Dene, uh, Odaemin, uh, Meiti, Sipi Winnewak, Papa Steel, Pie Suin, Ipiko Kanipiotsi, um, Gareyo, and Spomitapi. And here's a bonus for you for Edmonton, Amiskwetsi um, Waskaigan. Oh, cool. Wow, you absolutely killed it. All right. I thought I was really proud that I learned to memorize the one ward we were talking about today. And. Once again, I am the resident fool. Well, you have some work to do before our next next session. Uh, this is true. Uh, I mean, I do have my own ward down because uh, I've, I've been blessed with an extremely easy one, which is Papasteo. And it's easy to remember because, you know, whenever I can walk around, I just think, I think, I throw my hands up in the air sometimes, singing Ayo, Papasteo. And then you just, you know, how, how can you forget that? <laughs> well done. Mnemonics are important. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, the, I, that's honestly all of the questions I had regarding uh, regarding pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the black card, mm -hmm. which I don't know what this could stand for other than I love you and also I'm Joan Jet. But maybe maybe I can toss this one out to you guys. And to our audience, we'll we'll put any comment on screen. Watch, watch. I'll put any comment on screen, even extremely trite comments like David's. I think that's very pertinent and an astute observation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I so for me, I, I always feel like a black heart is like. 
I always see it as like our love has shriveled and died. Um, <laughs> <laughs> having never received a black heart and only sent them, um, that's how I've meant everyone. Okay. Yeah, do you send a lot of these? I mean, everything's relative, and who's to say how much is a lot? Hmm. Um. You sure. got my text I today, right? Um. I did my phone receive it? Absolutely. Did I read mm -hmm. it? I'll leave that as an exercise from the audience. Okay. Well, there's one, I guess, if we're counting. All right. Well, I would like to get through at least the last of this top row of hearts before we get to our sincere questions, because I did uh, I did receive a note from our producer before today's episode, which is, of course, Nicole, shadow producer of the show. And I, I was told to be on my best behavior and to only be sincere. So I, I can only ask in the sincerest way possible, what on God's green earth does a brown heart mean? There's a brown heart? There is a brown heart. I mean, there is in Discord. I assume it's the same as everywhere. Let me look at my keyboard right now. Oh, wow. This is a great Ooh. idea because, I don't know, I feel like if somebody gives me a brown heart, this is troubling. Like, you know, it's not a black heart, but they don't find our love to be colorful. So I, this is off topic, but I recently saw a spoken word poem about um, talking about how people, wi people wishing, or talking about someone wishing that they had blue eyes and it was a brown heart and talking about how, about all the beautiful things that are brown um, and how brown, your eyes are brown, like the earth that all of our food and our flowers and our trees grow from. And it's like the trees that are, and it was, it was really beautiful. Uh, if I find it, I can send it, but um yeah, I wouldn't necessarily take it as a bad thing. Um, I feel like I've only sent a brown heart if it's right next to a poop emoji. So, I mean, there's also that to consider, but we, we don't have to read too much into that. Well, I'm reading, I'm just looking at the, you know, heart emojis in my keyboard right now or in my, my phone. And it's interesting just because of like the lighting and an angle. It actually looks more like a bronze color instead of like, mm. you know, poop related brown, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, like a bronze heart might actually mean something in particular. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, bronze, like, bronze is a kind of a nicer way to describe brown things. Um, like, I feel like my poops would be a lot less embarrassing and shameful if I described them as bronze, so. <laughs> I, I might do that in the future. So wait, so so where have we landed? But what is what does the brown heart mean? Or sorry, what does the bronze heart mean? So I just looked it up because I knew that there's a bronze anniversary, um, and apparently it's the eighth anniversary. So maybe it means I love you when we've been married for eight years. That's a very specific emoji. <laughs> <laughs> so my emojis in my like Samsung keyboard here, I guess this is the Google keyboard, don't even give me the option of, oh no, it's in my message app of the brown heart, which means that, I guess it means that they think people who have this phone are never gonna make it eight years in a relationship, which, I mean, I feel really called out by that. <laughs> <laughs> but can you say that it's inaccurate? Well, that's why I feel called out because it's painfully accurate. <laughs> Do you want to talk about oh, man. it? Uh, I really want to. I really want to talk about the inconsistency of emojis across devices because, my goodness, whenever I try to send, you know, uh, like I, I had uh, an Apple device for a while through work, and so uh, this was a this was a job where we had to talk about a lot of eye roll worthy things, and so you would use the eye roll emoji, which is very blatant. It's eyes straight up. That emoji does not look impressed, um, but. It turns out that same emoji when viewed on an Android phone is kind of an extremely like saucy emoji of someone going like, hey, and rolling their eyes to the side, mm. which is like just about the close to the opposite emotion as you can get. So I'm not too sure. I, like this, how is this, how is this not being regulated? Like why is the UN not stepping in and forcing the emojis to be the same? 
I, I don't know if this is maybe something you could run on Giselle. I don't know if it's too late to update your campaign platform, but if you wanted to run an emoji standardization, I think that would be great. Oh, I wonder what kind of jurisdiction that would fall under. Mm, now, something I will pass on to my research team. <laughs> yeah. Can we also talk about, like, I feel like we need to have a discussion about people using inappropriate emojis or, like, emoji, emojis that seem off. Like, so, if you were to say, like, I, if I were to receive a kissy face emoji, like, it's usually either from one of my close friends or my partner um but i have an uncle and i don't know if it's a cultural difference because he is from switzerland but he used to send me kiss emojis all the time as like a okay love you this is not a weird thing by the way my uncle and i have a very platonic relationship this is not it's not weird he means it in like a in like a just a very light like okay good talking to you have a nice day kind of way but it's a kissy emoji and i'm like how do i explain to him that this is weird like is there like a psa that we can put out to be like hey kissy emojis are for partners or like close friends if you know each other like that but like maybe not between family hmm. is your is sorry this is your uncle you said yes is he italian He's I was Swiss. about to ask, actually. <laughs> yeah. Italian. Yeah. He yeah. is Swiss, which is I hear from people from that live in that have lived in Europe is the opposite of Italian. The complete, <laughs> the complete opposite. So no, yeah. like the double cheek kiss, kissy beso situation. Like, yeah. Oh, actually, that's not true. Actually, they do do the they do do the double kiss in Switzerland. Oh, okay. Which was so really awkward that. when I was in Switzerland and then I went to France and they only did one kiss in France. So I was always going in for a second one and it was like this whole like <laughs> <laughs> whole situation. Yeah, maybe that's uh. the emoji for the double kiss thingy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's ah, uh, okay. That's all coming together now. Yep. It is a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. I only have one more insincere question before we get to the real questions. And by that, this is actually a very sincere question. I just, everyone's gonna read it as as different. But so all, all of us here on the show, I would say it's, it's fair to say that we're single issue voters. And my single issue is plastic lawn signs, which I think should be banned. And I'm wondering if I could get you to run on this platform because I will move to your ward in the next month to vote for you if you say yes. Well, here's the interesting thing. Like, as a first-time candidate, it's really confusing. Like, what you know? What's the Canadian cultural? You know, what are you supposed to do to run a campaign here? And yeah, like I felt really torn up about getting law and science. But here's where I give myself some comfort. I, like, and this is actually legit. Like, I'm an abstract artist using recycled materials, so um, I'm gonna have enough canvases to put paintings for the rest of my life if you know regardless of the outcome of the election so yeah um i don't know like it um i've heard sentiments like there's so many people who actually would prefer not to have a plastic lawn sign so i, I think you actually have you know there's some there's some merit there or i don't know like, what could be something that would be like biodegradable or kind of cool like i don't know like bubbles that will like so that do you you know after election day you like pop them and then they disappear i don't know like <laughs> so, so there's some kind of like technology like that I, that that would i would be i would be for that so Holograph. are you saying actually that you like you the the signs you put up have been made of like recyclable materials or that was just a thing you wanted to do um, no, it's just something I wanted to do. So, like, after mm. the election, yeah, like, um, because because they're actually pretty decent material. Like, you know, like, they're 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 flat, they're sturdy, they're, you know, a, a decent size to make paintings on, uh, which I've done before. Um, I've done paintings on uh, picture frames, like the glass, like, actual, like, picture, picture frames, um, cork boards, um, white, white boards. Yeah, yeah, so uh, definitely doable. Oh, so, like, the, the ones that you have put out like you are going to keep them and use them for like a lifetime's worth of canvases yeah mm -hmm. that's actually a pretty cool idea um i mean you could even like give them out to like just say hey i have this man like how many 
would you say that you have had made for this election? Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, I had 500 of these little guys, and I have 50 of the large ones, which is four feet by four feet. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, you can you could give away signs to like 400 people in your in your ward and still have more than enough canvases left over. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a legitimately cool idea, and I do believe that this could be a cross-partisan issue because I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's like, no, we need these. Like, no one loves them. Like, we just kind of do it, I think, as a matter of routine. And I mean, for every single candidate that's ever, I mean, even if somebody has won an election, they're not going to reuse their signs because they have to, you have to write re-elect, right? If you've been elected, like you can't just, you can't just paint it on your old sign, of course. Then... Yeah. You could put stickers though, which is actually what I did for my lawn signs. Here's a you know honest confession for you guys. I made a typo on the ward name on my lawn signs, which was oh. stressful. So <laughs> tweeting this out right now. I'm just kidding. I don't have a Twitter. Go on. <laughs> so, but what I did is I was able to order from the same company uh like a vinyl sticker uh stickers. Um, and then just like paste it on. So it, it was an easy fix. So my hope, you know, in the future, I think, yeah, just like on the corner, like this corner of the lawn sign, maybe I'll put a sticker there, like re-elect or something like that. Yeah. So at, at least that's the idea. Or um, maybe, or, may, or maybe I'll actually like calligraphy paint it myself. Who knows? Because I, mm -hmm. I can do that. So artistic mm -hmm. touch. So did you have like a little like working bee with like your friends? You got everyone together to like stick the vinyl stickers on a, on all of your lawn signs? Or did you just have to do that all yourself? Yeah, I pretty much did it myself. But it's more of like a cathartic experience because like while I was like putting the stickers, I was blasting like classic 90s Philippine pop music that I grew up in. And it's it's pretty incredible. So like mm -hmm. it's the like really like loud, like belting romantic, like I love you so much kind of songs. And mm -hmm. it's great. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's a way to uh, do campaign related stuff that's more like, physical instead of you know um arguing about platforms so mm -hmm. it's a good break <laughs> yeah it's like a sea shanty while you're working just like perfect yep nice that's right can you give an example of a like classic 90s philippine pop song oh geez does it have oh it I need to give you English ones or what? Or I don't know. I was just going to, if it, if it can be found on YouTube, I was going to start blasting it in the stream. Well, I will give you a name. Uh, I'll, I might as well give you the name of the artist I was listening to. I'll put it in the chat, but their name is AGs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you mention that to like any like millennial and older um, Filipino person, they will recognize it. They're, they're amazing. They're, um, it, the, the, Vocalists are usually like uh, the two, like two women, like sisters, I believe. But sometimes they have uh, their um, male um, guitarist uh, and doing a duet with one of the ladies. Um, yeah, love, love, love it, love it. Um, also, a common um, common uh, artist in um, every karaoke machine you see in the Filipino home. So, <laughs> yeah. So that that is it's uh, quite convenient that I actually found a YouTube video that is. It, almost exactly two hours of nonstop ages songs. Yep. <laughs> and for for this being a two hour show, like we've really missed the boat here. We could have just simply played this from the minute one of the show and had a constant background music. That's um, yeah, that would have been great. In fact, if you guys just want to abandon everything we've done so far, and then we can just start over from there. Yeah, that'd be great. I have All right. a late. Uh, yeah, I mean, who? I mean, we all do, right? None of us are busy. None of us are doing anything. I don't know, important, are we? Like, it's not like we're running for office here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So go ahead and stall for me, Nicole, while I remember how to share my edge tabs. No, I figured it out again. All right. So here we have the ages nonstop songs. Oh heck yeah! <laughs> oh yeah. It? Look at that overall with the one strap undone. That's classic. I I should go for that look. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. Because I'm and just wearing a t-shirt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 o
And yeah, I don't know how long can you play this without being in trouble for copyright or whatever. So I, I don't know how that works. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I feel like if we talk over it the entire time without pause, we can't get DMC'd. But this is the kind of thing a smart person would look up uh, <laughs> before they get, you know, the, before they start committing to this. So um, you could be right. It's possible I should just stop <laughs> yeah but um well I'm, like i mentioned like that particular song really popular back then but yeah like that talks about you know like that late this the singer is like very very angry you know betrayal you know like i thought you were mine i thought you are true to me but you broke my heart like that's literally what mm. the lyrics were mm. is that the white heart is <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Because we do have to have something for the white heart. And I feel like there's some truly awful people on Twitter who will try to co-opt it as like their secret white supremacy heart. And so we have to we have to get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. We have to get it we have to get ahead of them by calling it the betrayal heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reasonable people might argue that that's what the broken heart emoji is for, but I refuse to be a reasonable person. So Yeah, we're aware. So Getting on to the sincere questions, uh, I do have a confession to make, which is that I was really gung ho about reading up on your entire campaign platform today and, you know, maybe watching some of the videos you posted. Uh, and instead, I pottered around while eating breakfast and I went for a long walk today. And it turns out I didn't actually look at anything. So for the sake of me, if no one else, uh, like if you had to kind of give a 30 second elevator pitch for what you're running on, what would that be? Well, my quick pitch, which I also use at the doors is that I am running to fight for the benefit of everyday Edmontonians. Those that actually rely on basic um, city services, making sure that um, all these services provided by the municipality work well for everyday life and that people who um, contribute, you know, taxpayers also feel that they, they are contributing well and have good value of the money that they are contributing to our society. But yes, fighting for everyday Edmontonians. That's my, that is the most concise version of it. Mm -hmm. What kind of like response do you find you get just as a candidate knocking door to door? Because I mean, politics, as we know, is, you know, famous for how calm it makes people and how no one ever tires of talking about it. So like, yeah, like, like do you find that... Um, yeah, I don't know if you could describe kind of how people have been in your interactions with them. Like, how do they, how much do they want to listen to what a door-to-door -door candidate has to say? It's really interesting, you know, as a first-time candidate and an immigrant who was also familiar with a different political system before moving here. I was 16 when I moved here. So it's really fascinating to observe how people behave at the doors. I mean, it. I mean, the reality is most people actually don't open. So, you know, the sample size significantly shrinks then, right? But uh, for those that do open um, the doors, many are actually pretty, um, you know, they're not, they are really not paying too, too much attention just yet about municipal uh, politics because of the federal election that just concluded. And also because there's a bit of um, confusion and, um, you know, what municipal governments actually do because there's less... Uh, drama about it uh, when it comes to the news cycle, if that makes sense. For totally. those that, um, so sometimes when I have to ask, when I ask questions, I actually prompt them by listing out the different things that the city does, you know, any questions about transit, property taxes, snow clearing, garbage, libraries, police, and sometimes that prompts uh, questions. Um, so there's a lot of questions uh, I get about, um, you know, taxes, property taxes, um, spending or feeling that they're not getting their value out of it. Um, depending on the neighborhood here in CP Winnowak, um, we all of us, most of us here on the West End just got our garbage bins. So it's a bit of a learning curve. And I've been getting some uh, um, complaints and concerns about that. It becomes an educational opportunity. I tell them that. If you have a seven plus person household, you can order a bigger bin. And they're like, what? Or, you know, like this is actually how the schedule works and get really informative um, for them. Uh, transit is a big one, especially since about four to five neighborhoods here in the ward are now 
um, going through the pilot project of the on-demand uh, bus system. Um, just like my neighborhood, half of my transit trips are now in the um, on-demand bus system. Um, some had mentioned uh, concerns about accessibility, snow clearing, and uh, you know, just making sure that every every single like infrastructure in our community, a person in a wheelchair can actually get to. The answer is hardly no. It's not the case at all. It's remarkable how many steps or stairs are in every house. But you know, that's a I'll, I'll, I'll rant about that another day. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit of everything. And whenever I get someone at the door who's a permanent resident, uh, they're like, sorry, not yet a citizen. I also take that as an opportunity to educate and tell them that, um, yeah, sure, you cannot vote yet. But um, what we decide on, it's the most like, tangible uh, way that governments impact communities. So if we have issues about transit and snow, snow clearing and whatnot, let me know. So yeah, that's kind of what I have been uh, uh, getting at the doors. Okay. So sorry, you talked a bit about the on-demand bus system. What is that? Yeah. So my uh, my more uh, I guess fun analogy. It's like Uber and an airport shuttle had a baby. Like that's kind of how I describe it. But mm -hmm. basically, what happened is you know the city had a citywide bus network um, redesign. It took them two years to do consultations, and the big uh, dilemma, I suppose, or the question they pose to the community is that the city has grown a lot, but the transit budget is still the same. So looking at these routes, you have to make a choice. Do you want more frequent routes, but you might have to walk a little bit more? Or do you want, uh, you know, yeah, it's a frequency versus um, coverage trade-off. <clears throat> and then for certain neighborhoods here in the West and in many other parts of the city, where it's still like a brand new neighborhood, so ridership is really not quite there yet, or we it's just like so isolated that um, ridership has been low for a while. Um, they decided that to to not have a frequent or like a, a, a standard bus route with like the big bus and have this on-demand bus instead. So you you phone or you um, book online or you th or through the app you um, you. You book a pickup time and then you go to the designated stop. It picks you up and then it takes you to a transit station or another uh, neighborhood nearby that has the on-demand um, system or to a major road. So for me here in um, Rio Terrace, it can take me to Cameron Heights. It could take me to West Edmonton Mall, Meadowlark, and some of the neighborhoods around like Parkview and Sherwood. But um, yeah, I mean... I had to be an expert at it because of necessity. So I also take that as an opportunity to discuss it with people because people are really upset that it, it that their neighborhood has is, has lost their frequent nice big bus and now had this on demand bus system instead. And I tell them that I'm not thrilled about it either. But like seriously, please give it a try and give like constructive feedback when scheduling and capacity and whatnot yeah mm -hmm. overall uh, yeah it's it's actually working okay i can see the merits of it and um yeah it's already september so there's just about a year and a half left in the pilot project right right because so you don't you i saw in your uh, website it says you don't drive so you take transit exclusively so you can mm -hmm. kind of, yeah that kind of thing yeah yeah which is a, a cool perspective to have when you're running for like city councilor right because I don't know how many city councillors have that point of view. Um, and so yeah. like having that, having to work with that for, firsthand is a pretty cool, um, I guess, give, gives you a, a good a handle, I guess, on it. That's yeah, absolutely. I mean, some councillors, I think even the mayor, like they do take transit sometimes. Like there are actually times like I see them on the LRT and whatnot, but it's a different frame of mind when you cannot drive and when you miss the bus and you're like, oh, crap, I'm stranded, which has happened to me many, many times, whether at West Edmonton Mall, at the university, South Campus, um, and all of those some different places. So, yeah, like there's a it's a it's a different way of living in the city if you're unable to drive. So. Yeah, and I really want to bring that perspective um, with my community engagement. It's also why I volunteered for three years for the Edmonton Transit Advisory Board, which we do have in the city. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, like I, I would even add to what you're saying is that like, so I, I I grew up in, you know, the deep suburbs. And so it was, you know, the the 
the buses there are effectively the, just for show. I mean, the it's a it's a whole lifestyle and environment where it's it's simply like a given that you're just going to get a car. You know, it's just. Uh, you live in a place that's not transit accessible and it tends to be filled with people that are very affluent. And it was just, I have had access to a car since I was a teenager and it was only kind of later on and learning about um, like urban planning in school and learning about transit that you go, Oh wow. Like there's this whole Metro area is really a bit of a swing and a miss on setting up for transit because you know, it, cities like ours were built at a time where, transit was like seen as like or, or, or i should say that like the cars were seen as the way of the future and when the environment is so built for cars like you can only make the buses so good and so i as somebody who owns a car and you know has benefited from that and really wants to use transit more it's it's prohibitively difficult so often in that like it's you know even the car aside, like it's faster to ride my bike most places than it is to take transit. But, you know, in winter that doesn't work. And so as, and uh, as somebody who has already committed to the expenses of owning a car, the, the registration and the insurance, um, for me looking at a bus fare that is, you know, costing me $6 now to go anywhere um, or committing to another hundred dollars a month for the past, it's, it's it's prohibitively expensive to get into transit because you know i i make enough money to maintain a car but not enough really to have the luxury of throwing on a transit pass on top of that so I've, I've often kind of found that's one of the like frustrations i've had from living in edmonton is you know i've been to cities with wonderful transit and it's i just wish i could explain to people how nice it is to mm -hmm. be able to like like imagine living somewhere where somewhere is across town and you can you can hop buses on there and you, you'll never want for a car, you know, like that's how it was in, in Seoul and Tokyo and Kobe and places like that, that I went. And it was so, it's so frustrating to come back here and it's just this endless expanse of asphalt. And yeah. So I don't know if I should lead up to a question here. That was just my rant, but. Mm -hmm. No, well, one thing um, that's probably worth mentioning and I am personally looking forward to is we are um, entering the modern times and we are going to have a digital way to um, pay for transit fare. You, It's the ARC card system. It's like the Metro Pass that uh, New York City has. So we are finally getting it soon. Um, it's going through, it, it has a, it's going through like a pilot stage right now. So not everyone has access to it. I think full mm. implementation is 2022. But yes, since I take the bus on a regular basis, sometimes carrying the lawn signs to do campaign related mm. errands. Um, yeah, I have seen people um, enter, you know, tap the card onto the machine and hear like that beep. And then, you know, on their way out, they tap it again. And I'm like, this is real. Okay, I'm excited. So it's mm -hmm. happening soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's um it's and it's funny when to see things like that even being a pilot because there's a part of me that goes like, you know, like what are we piloting? This has been done in in many cities like we know it works. I we know. we like just do it, just implement it because it's it's I know people have described coming to Edmonton and just being shocked that uh uh like n not only do we not have the like the tap cards as so many cities do, but even uh, I think it was like that you still couldn't buy the tickets at the station with a credit card, like it was cash only, or am I misremembering that? That's correct. I'm, I've experienced that firsthand. So when I went to Calgary for, uh, for an errand at the Philippine consulate and they're like, oh, that, that thing that says debit, like that actually works. Oh, I was so shocked and I was nerding out. I was like live tweeting my transit trips in Calgary all day because I was so excited. But um, yes, um, over here, it, the debit machine doesn't work. Um, now, though, again, because I'm, I've seen it quite a bit, I suppose this is part of the, uh, you know, um, full launch of the ARC card. The new machines um, in the transit stations, I've seen it in South Campus that yeah, there's uh, there's the old machine where you can buy tickets and stuff. And then there's the new one right beside it um, where you can, I suppose, like refill your um, ARC card. And there's like, um, you know, like the symbol for when you pay tap on like a typical debit or credit machine in a store, like the, the mm -hmm. thingy is there too. So I'm, uh, so they're, they're, they're building an infrastructure. So. Hopefully it'll be there finally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's um that's always been a frustrating thing for me because I also I have a car but I try to take transit. But yeah, it's 
I have a whole other rant, but that's about the Calgary transit system and has nothing to do with you guys. So I'll leave it out of here. But um, it's, it's always so frustrating when you're like, you know, I have even it, like to get on the bus. It's like I have I have a twenty dollar bill and I have a credit card and I have a debit card, but I can't get on the bus because I don't have three fifty and change. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating, and it's like makes no sense. I'm like, why? Why do I even have all these things ways to pay for things if I can't pay for like the one thing that I need right now? Oh yeah, but. totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. You you mentioned uh, that you were making an errand to the like the Philippine uh, consulate. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I think that'd be like a unique perspective to hear about. Like, what is your kind of like, I mean, wait, what were you doing there that day? But like, what is your relationship as a, uh, as an immigrant to like your country of origin? Like, I don't know if you have anything to speak on there. Oh boy, where do I begin? That's why I have a blog on this. And I and actually, yeah, it's worth sharing. Like I do have a personal blog where I documented my life story and um, I'm starting to, it, it's, it's a bit of an emotionally draining experience to share like my life story. But I, whenever I get requests from, um, different projects, you know, like share to me your life story. And I'm like, yeah, of course, I'm more than happy to because um, there's a lot of these projects now, you know, collecting stories of immigrants from all over the country. And there's different ways that it's presented, you know, like I contributed to an anthology of Edmonton immigrants and I contributed to an um, anthology of like, you know, I guess amazing, you know, 150 immigrant women. I'm like, oh, okay, sure, I'll, I'll pass my story. But um, I guess long story short, um, I was 16 when I moved here and I, you know, before that I grew up in the Northern Philippines, um, you know, mountain region and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, my brother and I are orphans, like our parents died in a, well, we were there too. Like we had like a very like bad like vehicle accident and uh, my, my parents and sister and a lot of other people didn't make it. My brother and I um, survived and um, it's really, I guess it's really an educational moment for um, Canadians, how I got into Canada, because, you know, there's a sponsorship process and everything, right? I was sponsored through the category of family class for orphans. So normally you cannot sponsor nieces or nephews. They're too, like the relationship is too far removed with the exemption of fully orphaned kids. So that's how I got to Canada. And um and because I was 16 when I moved uh, here, you know, I'm pretty uh, familiar with the culture. I'm old enough to have like memories and my viewpoint in life shaped by um, what I experienced growing up. But 16 is such an important age and stage for of a teenager's life. You know what I mean? So a lot of my young adult experiences are here. And um, I remember growing up because, you know, I'm a pretty academically competitive person, like English class, like language and grammar are actually my favorite classes. Like I get like high 90s in English. So um, so adapting to here is actually um, a bit easier. Of course, I speak still a little bit like formally. And if you give me a sentence, I can break down its grammatical components. Like I we have, we've learned that growing up. But um, yeah, like. Um, in, in my household, my brother and I, for the most part now, we still speak Tagalog to each other, except for his first year when he came here, because he came four years after me. And I'm like, I'm going to train you. I'm going <laughs> to talk to you only in English. And, you know, I'm going to take you to West Edmonton Mall and you're going to order our food and, you know, just to get his uh, comfort level. Um, yeah, I got... I got my citizenship in 2012 and I'm still considering doing my dual citizenship. The paperwork is just a little bit like um, challenging. Um, with my relatives, um, a few of them are in Edmonton in, um, or in Canada, but I have relatives um, all over the world. So um, yeah, it's it's been a really fluid process trying to like reconnect or stay involved with my cultural community while letting my own values evolve because you know i guess i have a bit of an outsider's perspective there's some cultural things that i really don't like um for example the concept of filipino time which is just being casually chronically late for everything <laughs> i hate it like i i'm very respectful of people's time I want to arrive early and get things done on time. So I, I'm like rejecting that entire cultural premise altogether. Um, but yeah, like, you know, my I think my language proficiency is pretty okay, although I get rusty with certain like common um, 
um, conversational words, which makes me worried. But um, yeah, like my husband is a born and raised Edmontonian, so that's mm. another like angle that we'll definitely explore as we as we get older. He has been to the Philippines a few times, and what really surprised me is that all the fancy touristy places we've been to, because we've, and we've been to a lot. We went there for three months. Um, he th- they, he finds them like kind of nice, but what he really loved is the quaint little mining village where I grew up because it's so far, it's so remote environmentally. It's like actually like nice and pretty and cool. We have pine trees there. So like it's mm-hmm. that cool, like evergreens everywhere. Um, but um, yeah, so it's a bit of a, a rant, but uh, yeah, like that's kind of, you know, it's a, it's an evolving process, right? Like staying connected to my, uh, my, um, my cultural community and identity. I describe myself as Filipino Canadian. Um, you know, I find it a bit awkward sometimes when um, people ask me right away if I'm Filipino or not. And I'm like, and I was like, yes, I am. Or I guess it depends on who asks. Like if it's like a fellow Filipino who asks, I feel a little bit more okay. But if it's a non-Filipino who asks, um, it's it's a little bit awkward because um, what's the term that I like using? The occupational stereotyping comes up immediately afterwards when they're like, oh, you're Filipino? My nanny's Filipino. (laughs) All the healthcare workers I know are Filipino and I have mixed feelings about it. You know what I mean? Like on one hand, it's true. And at the same time, like we're here, like the younger generation Filipino Canadians who are who don't fit in that stereotype anymore. So, yeah, it's a it's it's a it's it's a journey in itself. Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we should probably pivot soon. I wanted to ask kind of one more question because sure. I know you'd alluded to the kind of the idea of you know, people are maybe a little less interested in local politics or less invigorated by it because part of it is the news cycle. And part of it is that it, I think it's, I'm guilty of this as anyone, it's easy to feel like the national politics matter the most, or mm-hmm. even in some cases, the national politics of another country. But it's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's amazing how much of our everyday life is, you know, shaped by being able to add maybe more think and act local. Um, but I'm also I'm curious because uh, what you think of this because I think, to me, what should be like the main issue we're talking about in most elections now, is climate. Um, it's I think it's extraordinarily under talked about considering the degree to which we're barreling towards collapse. So I, I, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts of how you view your role in that as like a, as a municipal candidate, like what can we do at the municipal level that's, that's worth anything? Um, I think this is a lot of work because um, not only do we need to like do it like volume wise, like do it a lot, but to do it in different ways and languages for lack of a better word, like education, I think is a really, really big component to it, to this, because um, in, in a way that demonstrates what is the impact of municipal politics. And from an, from an immigrant's perspective, to do an appropriate and comprehensive contrast, how different is municipal politics here compared to wherever we came from? Um, this is a bit of a side note. And I think this is why a lot of you know, my fellow immigrants kind of like check out is um, many of us come from countries where politics is so much more violent. Um, when I told my brother I'm running for office, he was like legit scared because like in the Philippines, in many places, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how many local politicians will get murdered after this political election cycle. So, um, so, and and when you migrate to a different country, like the the idea is that you've already left the environment that you love, and over here it's mostly like survival. So you know, like work your ass off, like two to three jobs, and um, you know, I suppose when if and when, which takes a while, um, you get your citizenship, then you go and vote. Imagine someone who's been here maybe as a temporary foreign worker for five years. And then a permanent resident for five years. And then there's like chaos with their citizenship application. And then they got their citizenship four years after. 14 years living in Canada, never had a chance to vote. So how, how, how can you even like educate and tell people to get engaged before they're able to vote? And then addressing the like misconceptions or like 
not feeling like you belong in the political conversation in this country. So that's a, and that's a huge one because people come to Canada at under like different types of visas and whatnot. And um, if, for instance, if you've been a if you hold like certain jobs and you know have never been part of your community league or whatever, like you feel entirely like disconnected from political discourse during your entire time in Canada. And it, so like flipping it to the born and raised Canadians for lack of better word. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm starting to learn that you guys here um, learn about civics in grade six. You know, there's like city hall school or whatever. At least that's the case here in Edmonton. I really think that um, in, incorporating it, it, incorporating it more in other classes in junior high and high school. Um, you can tell, like I didn't go to high school here. I think you guys have a thing here called Calm, you know, like yeah. high skills course or whatever. So incorporating it there might also be handy. Um, and um, and yeah, and part of and then another angle that I have noticed is. I know there's a, like, uh, the budget of a city councilor is very limited, so it's not like they can send you know the same like amount of like mail brochure things as like federal politicians or whatever. But I think um, constant like presence and communicating would actually help a lot, and that's how that's why I do my videos and social media and whatnot. It's really it's really reaching out to a lot of people who are not um, really engaged or uh, are not very aware of how things work municipally. And um, I think I think it's making at least a little bit of an impact. But yeah, like a lot of, I guess, continuous, relentless, like educating, I think, and, you know, telling people why is it important, probably translating it in different languages. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, communication i think that uh that needs to happen to help change the mindset as far as uh impact of municipal government yeah and i think it would be nice to kind of um be able to change that um like what you specifically alluded to about the fact that even permanent citizens aren't able to vote on the issues of places that they do live and i, I I kind of personally think there's a lot tied into like what to me is, I don't know, just dumb and sucky about the whole immigration system in that it's, it does so much gatekeeping towards people for the crime of being born on a different patch of dirt. And I don't know, I feel like we could get into this, but this is probably another hours long rant and we probably <laughs> should bring out our, uh, our GM here, Josh, because I know he's got, uh, he's got a comprehensive um, platform for immigration reform that he's just dying to share. So, <laughs> yeah, we can bring up Josh right now. <laughs> oh, man, I even get my own uh, intro music now. When I was going to college uh, for political science, I did end up having to write a massive paper on immigration policy because I fucked up a group, group project. So, uh, I mean, that's about 10 years out of date now, but I do remember being quite upset when I was looking at immigration policy at that point. Maybe because I did it for 12 hours straight or maybe just because the system's bad. Maybe both. Mm. But actually, uh, before we get started on this game, I have to say that I was super happy to hear you guys talking about the transit stuff. I've recently moved to the downtown and I'm trying to use my car as little as possible if I'm not going to work. So um, to hear, first of all, the debit thing is excellent to hear because I've been bitching about that since I moved to the city and that's six or seven years ago now. Um, so, and when I went to Vancouver a couple of years ago, I was immediately made aware at just how bad our uh, monetary transit part was in this city. So I'm glad to hear it's getting better, basically. And I'm glad that it's uh, an issue that you find very important as well. So that's my little contribution to this wonderful conversation that I've been listening to this entire time. So yeah. Josh, which ward are you in? And uh, oh, can you pronounce it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that people went through that pronunciation list because I've actually been looking at the signs in my ward and being like, shit, that looks <laughs> yeah. like it's easy to pronounce, but I don't know. 
So yeah. But I'm not confident enough to say it out loud to this person. <laughs> yeah, oh exactly. yeah, I live in the moon. Yeah. <laughs> I live downtown. Uh, but yeah, no. It's uh, like when someone introduces themselves three or four times and you still haven't caught how like what their name is, and you're like, oh yeah, this is my friend Kayla. You just sort of just <laughs> squint your eyes a little bit and nod, uh, like sort of try to sound it out. But yeah, no. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know. I have a photographic memory of everyone I've ever met. I never forget a name or a face. Perfect. Yeah. As we all know, I definitely didn't introduce myself to Kelly four different times before he actually remembered who I was. Moving on. <laughs> um, yes, yes. I suppose we should get going on this game here. Um, so a recap for those who weren't there last time. Yeah, and while you're doing that, I'm going to grab my onesie. Yeah, it's fair. Oh, it's a full <laughs> onesie party. Damn, mm -hmm. I don't even have one of those. Um, oh, well, I know what you're getting for Christmas. Oh, I'm touched. Except, <laughs> please don't. It's way too warm at any point in this apartment. It's so, yeah. This is very warm. Yes. What an argument. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, la the people who weren't there last time, um, our heroes had been trapped in a cave by goblins, um, which were then brutally murdered by heroes, while our heroes watched and sold them poutine the entire time. So I think the moral of the story is that capitalism makes monsters of us all, especially if you're a poutine salesman. <laughs> so they're on the run right now, and that's that's where we're gonna drop in here so once kelly returns we'll get a full comprehensive introduction of characters ah oh, there's the man right there what's uh, up we're gonna get an introduction of our characters once again for our final route of this uh mishap and adventure that i've created for you all so Mis uh mishap like are you mispronouncing the word misshapen no okay um making up words because the english language is a wonderful thing where you can just jam stuff together and if you have enough context to it people will sound it out and it'll work that's actually josh the name of josh's new blog about things that are happening in edmonton <laughs> um, which he writes under the pseudonym miss happen yes yes definitely thank you uh, i would clap but I don't want to make my microphone pop. Fair. Uh, Josh, yeah. actually, we can, before we go on, I, did, I didn't even ask you, what's your favorite way to pet your cat and or dog? Well, the nice thing with this cat that I've gotten recently, who I would show, but she seems to be sleeping and I don't want to bug her, is that she loves tummy rubs and not in the way that most cats do, where they like show their belly and you're like, oh, they want a belly rub. And then they immediately just start like clawing your hand up. She mm -hmm. actually like flips over and she's like, please just rub my belly for as long as possible. Uh, so that's usually how I engage with her is I'll walk over and annoy her and then just tap her belly and she'll flip over and now rub it. Mm. I like that you guys have this nonverbal communication thing going on where you just have to poke her in the belly and then she flops. Yeah, straight up. It's great. That's I've only great. had her for what, two weeks now? And she's just like, she's always lived here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Made for each other. So it seems, but yes. So onto the game. Um, we'll start with you as usual, Kelly. What what uh, what was your character again? Why don't you remind the audience? Uh, my character's name is an angina pectoris. Um, she is packed and stacked, especially in the back. And angina has spent years chaining one scheme after another to cheat her lovers out of their disposable income. Uh, of course, she caught a little too much heat on the last one and needs to lay low in the last place anyone would think to look for her doing honest work now i of course i wrote that before this whole adventure started i'm not sure that angina has done the best job of laying low whether or that's by work. yeah like <laughs> hanging out with people that are well i was doing honest work and no you're right I, yeah i kind of stopped that also yeah i feel like between hanging out with the like eye gouging people and getting wrapped up in a big scheme to like marry this i don't know weird chieftain of an orc village to i don't know the whole debacle with the like reanimating rat zombies or whatever last time i, I feel like angina has actually been very visible and this is probably not uh in her best interest but we'll see and next is nicole okay um so my character is uh gondelf um i am a an elf and wizard 
Um, <clears throat> Uh, I got lazy and when I was filling out the what do you look like category and so I just decided that I look like whatever your perception of an elf is. That's how I appear to people. <clears throat> um, but uh, basically I'm a wizard who is working hard to put themselves through wizard college. Um, but despite taking out a substantial wizard loan, I've been forced to work a part-time wizard job selling frozen goat's milk treats at my parents' ice cream business, The Fairy Queen. Perfect, perfect. And now, finally, our guest here, if you would not mind uh, stating what your character's name is and what they do as a food cart entrepreneur. Absolutely. So my character's name is Genevieve Gazelle. Um, I am a human who happened to uh, skin a giraffe and has it as my standard uniform while I'm <laughs> operating my business. My business is I sell uh, burritos that named after precious metals. I haven't had a name of my actual cart yet, but the, uh, the top three items of my menu are the golden guacamole, the silvery fishy tacos and the platinum level beef burrito. Brilliant. Perfect. Uh, I'm just going to write down one of those because that golden guac actually sounds amazing. <laughs> and I need to need to remind myself of that whenever I have the chance, because if I ever open a burrito stand, that'll be what I'm calling it. I might awesome. put gold flakes in it since that seems to be the trend right now with influencer food. So, well, it's trademarked control. now, Josh. So, oh, yes, this is true. I'm gonna get run into a trade war here now, but <laughs> yes. So, when we last left our adventurers, they were fleeing from a goblin cave after the heroes massacred the entire goblin thing. And so, it was, it was horrible. Like, there's been so much more blood in this campaign than I expected there to be. Uh, so as you're running away from this cave, though, you hear the sound of almost like a muffled crash, like like something that was being moved coming to a direct halt. And when you look, you see that there appears to be someone in some sort of animal skin outfit with a cart with its wheel fallen off. And being that you guys are on the run right now from fleeing goblins and potentially heroes that are stuffed on poutine now, uh, maybe that cart would be a good way of getting out of here. So what are you going to do? My two intrepid long-term heroes here. So I just want to be uh, clear on the situation. So we were selling uh, poutine to these uh, to these hungry adventurers who were slaughtering the goblins, right? Yes. As and they, then... were, they were running out there, killing a bunch of goblins, getting tired, getting hungry, coming over for a quick poutine, and then going back to the murder. You know, keeping their carbs up. This has right. a very like small town hockey rink vibe. <laughs> <laughs> There's a canteen and it only serves poutine and Twizzlers. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting some flashbacks, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so what has uh, what has happened to our business venture? Like, did it collapse, or did our former friends here just run off with our money, or what? Uh, yeah, you got scammed by the, um, the necromancer that was actually a rat operating a, a zombie corpse. Uh, See, what happened... this, this is why I was trying to railroad that guy's plans. I knew he was up to no good. All of yeah. these guests have been very untrustworthy so far. Basically, you know. while he was operating his own, shaking your hand, doing the business stuff, uh, his other remote controlled zombie walked away with a bag of gold. So, mm. you know, you can't trust a necromancer. Classic bait and switch. Mm. So you're still broke. You don't have any more poutine to sell, and you're on the run. And now you've found this cart here. Did did I was I able to at least abscond with um with my ventriloquist dummy? Uh, I believe his name Endo, but also randomly changed his name to Spanky by accident when I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Spanky is just what he does at night. So yes, right. he's called Endo. Okay, I still have Endo. Is is Gondelf still wearing Endo on her head with like a that like jumpsuit pulled over to make like the dummy's head is her head? Uh, I expect at this point she has probably handed over Endo back to you. You know because you don't feel right without your ventriloquist dummy at your side. 
All right. Um, so we're, we're, there's, this card is now in front of us? Yeah. It's, well, it's been to the side, but I expect because you guys are like, oh, an escape vehicle, you're slowly moving towards it. That's my railroading. You are going after this cart. All right. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm gonna walk up to this cart, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep my my dummy on the down low. I'm gonna kind of hide it in my bag because I don't want to pull up my ace in the hole too early. That's fair. So I'm just gonna saunter very gracefully up to this cart, and uh, like, does it look like it's selling stuff right now? Right now, it looks like. It's broken down, like it was supposed to go to the cave, and a wheel has fallen off the cart. Okay, and do I see anyone around it? You found this one person with a skin outfit of some kind that you can't quite recognize from a distance. But so, it's patch marked with uh, orange and yellow. Okay, then I want to I want to saunter up uh, gracefully, as I said, to the cart. And no, uh, if I sorry, if I remember correctly from our earlier conversation, orange and yellow is a mix of. This is a platonic relationship and friends with benefits. <laughs> so you're getting the like is it we're getting these kind of vibes, although like it's yellow with orange patches, so like probably more the platonic. Yeah, it's probably vibes. still just like it's pretty chill. Okay. <laughs> I'm I mean, just looking at her outfit right now, I'm seeing mostly yellow with like intermittent patches of orange. So it's kind of like this friend who, when they've got something else going on, tells your friendship is platonic, but maybe when they get broken up with, then they come crawling back to you and they're like, oh yeah, no, hey, I, I, I love hanging out with you and Netflixing and like, yeah, you know, just like very inconsistent. But of course it's a character, right? This is, this is not, uh, all characters here. This, is, this is not Giselle's real personality, as far as we know. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm going to saunter up very gracefully and uh, kind of airily just say, "Oh, hello there. Are you are you currently selling any any beverages? Oh, I am parched, Missus. Uh, that was me. That was me addressing Jean Diev Gazelle, or this person who I do not know yet. I like to use the French French pronunciation of Genevieve. Yeah. I'm well. I'm, oh, is it? Oh, it's pronounced. Oh, it's spelled that way. Is it Jean Diev? Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do Genevieve for simplicity's sake. We'll oh, we can do Genevieve. I, yeah, no, okay. no, she said Genevieve. It was me and my being a nerd who knows French uh, issues that kind of stampeded on this. So I, I, I walk up to this um, to this person whose name I don't know yet, and I say, "Excuse, excuse me, miss. Do you do you have a, do you have water?" Well, let me. Take a quick look at my cart here and see what I got. And unfortunately, I don't, but I have a big tub of salsa. Will that be adequately hydrating for you? Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I take whatever she offers me. I'm going to just chug some salsa tight. That's, that sounds brutal, but that's all, all the power to you. You feel... You feel the salsa slide down your throat, and you are invigorated. Um, can I just get a little, because we haven't done any rolling yet. We're already into the game break. Can I actually get you to roll a body check here? Um, I will, yep. To see how well you chug this salsa. I'm I'm trying to chug the whole thing. I mean, you're taking a drink of it. Okay. I, I, okay. Uh, well, I'm going <laughs> to apply my minus one to this roll. So I got uh, I got a nine on drinking salsa. Oh, oh man, you don't you, have anything I can dip in the salsa. I don't know why I want to drink it. <laughs> well, you don't. So <laughs> unless you're dipping your dummy in there. So um, I mean, my my uh, my dummy is made of like tortilla chips. So. Oh yes, of course. But uh, you know, you uh, you drink the salsa successfully. Any chunks of you know onion, garlic, pepper, whatever's in there, go down without a problem. Uh, and you feel satiated? Question mark. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I I mean as satiated as you can be with salsa. Uh, I I I decide to strike up a conversation with this person who seems pretty nice and not likely to gouge out anyone's eyes or anything. So I say, excuse me, there, miss. What is your name? Well, my name is Genevieve Gazelle, and you are. Ah, I am Anjana Pectoris, and this is my assistant, Gondelf, and I point backward to to Gondelf. And uh oh, and you you must be from out of town. Are you are you from the Western Mountains by chance? Um 
I actually cannot remember where I came from. Like things have been a blur on this journey here, and I've been too dehydrated to understand your question. <laughs> That explains hmm. why there's no water on the card. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so, so Gon, you were just called the, the assistant of Angina. Do you have anything you want to say to that? Uh, well, I mean, I'm being an elf. I'm like pretty used to being like dismissed as like only the secondhand characters. Um, so I'm like just kind of roll my eyes and like kind of whatever about it. I'm like too exhausted from selling poutine to fight about it. Um, but I can see that uh, Genevieve is like pretty pretty parched and like is in dire need of assistance. Um, so I'm going to try and like freeze some air and, and like, cause I, ha Oh, that was, sorry. That was my special ability is I can freeze things. Um, so maybe like if I can like freeze some ice from the moisture in the air and like maybe collect it into a cup for her. Is that a thing I can do? I think that you can do that if you roll the dice for it. Okay. And what am I, this would be body or what? Oh wait, I no, never mind. No, yes. the end under special. Yeah, is it okay? So I just yeah, just roll two yep. dice. Two d sixes. I got a five and a one. I got six. Six. I'm gonna say you get a small amount of water from the air, enough to like quench thirst, like you know, of uh, a, a person who's on the way out kind of deal. Got okay. a little splash in there. All right, I hand it to Genevieve, um, and then I, and then I also notice I so because I, I kind of took a while to catch up, so I, I just noticed the vat of salsa. So as I'm handing her a glass of water, I kind of think to myself like, why didn't she just have a glass of salsa if she was so thirsty? Notoriously um, but I, hydrating salsa. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I roll my I was like kind of whatever, and I, I hand her the glass anyways. All right, so everyone's hydrated for better or for worse here now, some with the tangy flavor of salsa on their tongues. Um, so what are you guys planning on doing about this wagon right now? Uh, I guess we're gonna, like, does it look repairable? It definitely looks repairable. You think you can get away with just replacing the sort of center plug of the wheel with just general, a piece of wood that you could cut off a branch or something like that. It, basically jury rig it without too much effort. It's It's not a terminal fail, it's just... That damn mass-produced bullshit these days. Nothing holds together anymore, mm. basically. So Gondel no. is like immediately like pretty pretty confident about this. Um, they dated a Gondel or I, I should say, I should use first person. Um, so I, I'm like pretty pretty confident that I can fix this. I dated an engineer once, um, and uh, for like three weeks. So like I'm pretty sure I know how things work, and uh, I'm gonna attempt to fix this. Um, All right. So. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna go to the nearest tree and try and break a branch off. Alrighty. So I'm gonna say that uh, you break the branch off without any issue. But if you're gonna try to fix this, you're gonna have to take a. I'm gonna say a combined roll. Roll your mind and then your body after that. Okay. To see if you can figure it out. Wait. So like one d six for each or two d six. Two d six is for both. Okay. Yeah. Two piece. Okay. So I got a nine for whatever the, what was the first one? Mind or body? The first one was, the first one was mind. So you can like okay, so see I, it all coming together. Okay. So I got a nine and a seven. Seven. Okay. So in your mind, you can see it all come together, but much like somebody who can visualize a beautiful painting in their mind, but can't paint, it doesn't quite work out the way you planned it. Oh. And when you attempt to move the cart to put the wagon wheel back on place, you find that you just don't quite have the strength to do it by yourself. Now, the other two right now, you two are watching Gondelf struggle with this right now. So what is your guys' plan? Um, I, I mean, I guess I just want to, like, offer to help. Um... Like, can I can I kind of like boost her ability to do this by? You absolutely can. Okay, just, how do... just give me a little body roll as well. You're always, you're always making me do body rolls. I know, I know you have a terrible body. <laughs> wow, feel called out. I got. <laughs> I listen. I I'm going to the gym soon. Okay, like, um, I I got an eight. You got an eight. Perfect. So the two of you can manage to now move the cart together 
One of you guys is like pushing up the cart, the other one's putting the wagon wheel into place. And you guys are able to start fixing it. However, as you guys are doing that, you hear that unmistakable sound of a goblin horde headed towards you. Not one that seems organized, one that seems panicked, like in full retreat. Hmm. Uh, I mean, what's, what's like behind them? Nothing at the moment. It seems they're just fleeing the scene of slaughter. There's no heroes or anything after them. They're just, they've managed to get out basically. And you see a small band of what appears to be about 10 to 15 goblins running towards you guys. They don't even seem to recognize you. It's like a blind panic at the moment. Okay. Uh, just to be safe, I want to duck behind the cart and put uh, Endo the dummy on top. Okay. Um, just because I I tend to get my face out there a lot, so I would I would like to hide if I can. You are perfectly able to hide. All right. I'm ready for him. All right. Uh, anyone else have plans here? You've you've gotten the cart somewhat repaired. You didn't have a chance to fully finish it before the goblins started showing up. So. So what I think I want to do because um, I have these, you know silver utensils for my burrito bake making business that I haven't used in a while. I want to throw them to the uh, uh, to the crowd and see if it uh, if it uh, you know hits them in the eyeballs and can prevent them from attacking us. Damn going straight for the eyes again. Okay, so we're gonna do that. <laughs> no. Yeah Kelly you had a bad read on this well, <laughs> new character. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> It's no, supposed, supposed to be a non-violent game, Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, but unfortunately, like I said, capitalism makes monsters of us all, and you're all mm -hmm. busy people here. Uh, so, what I'll get you to do then, uh, Genevieve, is to roll me a, a body roll. So, 2d6s plus whatever your body score, modifier is here. Sounds good. So, 3 and 3 plus 2, that's a total of 8. And 8, okay. So, while the utensils don't pierce the goblins in any way, they do look at them and realize that, holy shit, this is silver. And they almost stop, dead stop, to just start collecting these utensils up and look up to see what the source was. And when they see that it is you, they all of a sudden come up to you in, in sort of like uh, an awe way, like, oh my god. This person's so wealthy, they're just throwing silver at us. So you've got this, this horde of little goblins around you now who seem entranced with what you what you can do. What they look at you like a boss, basically. This person's so cool. They're selling, they're throwing silver. So how are you gonna address this crowd right here? So uh, Endo, the uh the, the the ventriloquist dummy speaks up from the <laughs> from their perch on the thing and says, "Oh, hey there, little friends! I'm glad you decided to join us. Do you like a party tricks?" <laughs> All right, so they're. Uh, I don't even know how to go with this. Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to get you. Let's roll a let's roll a mind right now. Actually, what was your special ability then? All oh, right, it was seduction, so that doesn't really work in this instance because you're doing ventriloquism. So, sure. I mean, I can I can just keep talking to them. Like like, did they look at me? Like, did they notice? Yeah, you me? Got, they got you got their attention because you're a wooden puppet on display here. I have a question. All oh, right, my friends. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so <laughs> your special ability is that. You have a way of being able to like kind of coerce or like influence people who are sexually attracted to your character. Yep. Does that project to your ventriloquist dummy? Like this if someone important. happens to be attracted to ventriloquist <laughs> dummies, will it affect them in the same way? I feel like that's up to the GM's discretion. Like I mean, maybe maybe I kind of roll with this advantage because, uh, you know, like my 
my vibe is still there, but the soothing uh, beauty of my voice uh, is kind of filtered. <laughs> you know, like I think I think what a lot of people like about me is the uh, the Northern Bell voice, and so when I'm when I'm speaking as Endo, uh, I would presume that people are like a little less, in, it's like slightly less aroused by that voice. Slightly less. Okay, just just, just a little bit though. So, yeah, so I, I'm going to address this crowd and say, you know, friends, we got lots more, lots more coins where those came from. If you can, you can just help us on our way. All right. So on that uh, thing, they're going to, they're going to look at the person who threw the silver. They're going to look at Genevieve here and they're going to be like, uh, is he with you? Uh, yes, he is my dear friend. What are you going to do about it? Mm? Oh, well, they, they sort of cower for a second at that. And they're just like, oh, we're just interested in what the boss's uh, other friends are like, because they're now referring to you as boss. Mm -hmm, of course. <laughs> because now that they've been driven out of their homes, they're actually... I just saw my title. Sorry, that made me laugh for a second. Um, they're now looking for a new crew to run with because their old crew has been brutally massacred. So they're like, well, boss, we can, uh, we can help move the cart towards wherever you need to go. Yes, absolutely. Just get yourself in the, like, is there like a harness there that they can like, <laughs> like, is there like a horse harness or something? I this make it to a sleigh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not tech. You paid, you paid for their services. If any, they're their employees right now. They have been paid in silver, Silverware, right? But how is the cart? How is the cart usually pulled? Um, it would usually be drawn by the person who owns the cart. It's one of those like little, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have the two bars that you have around you, and you just drive mm -hmm. it down there, like a wheelchair. Not like a wheelchair, <laughs> like like a small food cart that you would see where they just like have the two posts they pick up yeah, and you, walk you, with. You lift it and then yeah, exactly. Yeah, like wheel barrel. Not like a, barrel. It's, it's not like an entire wagon. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also, oh, it man. feels a little bit problematic that we're like making these goblins into like a monolith that only craves silver, but <laughs> we can just skim right over that. But I wouldn't say we. I say would. I would say Josh did that. I'm just trying to befriend the goblins. Right. Cool. Please, they're they're far more complex. And if you look into my lore bible on this setting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, like, I mean, we need we need to scan these goblins somehow. So, uh, I guess like. Um, like, do they have anything on them? Like, have they fled their homes with, like, the any... clothes on their back? The clothes on their back. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Can Wait, I even take the clothes on their back? <laughs> no, I feel like I'm nicer than that. I just, like, I mean, I get the impression that we just want to be out of this place because they, I don't know, these people really, um, like, if we're hanging around this like destroyed village too long, these adventurers are gonna, I don't know, they they're bloodthirsty, right? So, um, yeah, I, I feel like recruiting some goblin followers is a good idea. So I, I, um, but we don't have anything to offer, right? We're we're completely out of supplies. Well, I mean, they've been paid in silver. We've got salsa. We do have salsa. I mean, everyone knows goblins love salsa. This, this is a, a, a stereotype, right? Oh yes, definitely. Um, so yeah, uh, as it stands, they, uh, they are more than willing to assist you guys getting out of here, if that means that they can get out of here with you guys. Yeah. All right, you folks, is it, what's the best way out of here? And are there any, <clears throat> uh, hidden hordes having municipal treasure that those horrible raiders have not? Oh, what is that noise? What uh, is that, noise? that those horrible raiders have not accessed. Yeah, I'm going to see if they have any stashes. Uh, okay, I'm going to get you to do a mind roll for me right then there. Sure. Um, was, uh, is my mind also bad? I don't know. What is I, what is bad on your character? What isn't bad? No, the same. Uh, I got good psyche because I'm supposed to be charming. Um, yeah, okay, so I rolled a nine. You rolled a nine? Okay. So, they, uh, the one who see, appears to be the spokesperson for the goblins, you can tell that he's the the top head cheese here because he's wearing a cow skull on his head like a hat and he says well we don't have anything that we can offer you 
except good, reliable labor that'll show up eight to five every day except weekends if you just let us work with you at the moment. Oh, are you, the, are you some of them union ass goblins? <laughs> Workers' rights are no joke. We have rights. Well, all right, but I'm just telling you, make more money if you uh, just sound up with us as independent contractors. Yep, we got the contracts right here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, they're not going to take the contracts on you because they do believe very much in the 40 hour work week, as anyone should. And uh, two of them jump on top of the shoulders of their comrades. And with some sort of finesse that you would not expect, they pick up the cart and start moving it. Uh, so what we, I was laying beside the cart as I was doing this, right? Yes, you were. So I'm going to try to just like grab onto the cart and kind of hold on to it like, uh, I don't know, like an action star, I guess. Okay, uh, <laughs> perfect. Like that scene in the raid too. Uh, so yeah, you you uh, follow that. You grab onto the cart, and the goblins seem to strain for a second, but just adjust for it on the fly, basically, and keep running that cart down back towards where you guys originally started the cave, where all the adventurers come out and buy your wares. So all we've done is like a circle around like a forest. Is that like our That's entire your journey? Entire that has been your entire journey. That's how chaos. I'm glad you guys didn't go any further. I'd be here for the next two months. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, so I look around, um, specifically at Angina, and I say, "Do do we still have a goal here? Like, what's what are we trying to accomplish again?" Uh, and. Uh, Angina is a little, sh or I'm a little shocked that Gondalf has uh, noticed it's me on the card the whole time, but I, I brush it off. <laughs> um, I said, listen, Gondalf, all I've ever been trying to do is break even, and I'm pretty sure I've lost money so far, so we got two options. And I, I, I kind of, like, is the whole cart moving? The whole cart's moving right now. Are we all in it? You guys are, well, you're hanging off of it, because this is a small wheelbarrow Heart, basically right uh, and the other two are walking beside you yeah okay so oh, they're they're walking beside me so yeah. i kind of i pull gondelf in closely um and i whisper in her ear um we got two options either we scam the goblins or we scam the giraffe lady your dealer's choice <laughs> what why are those our only our only two options i tell you what you you give me um thirty bucks and I'll be out of your hair forever. We pretend none of this ever happened. Also, can I just ask why like you pulling me in close, why are you still doing your ventriloquist voice? Oh forgive me, dear. Sometimes I get caught up in the moment. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I would I am a, a trained as an actor when I was younger, you see. Mm. Uh but I'll I'll be I'll be why don't listen what what are, what are we really doing here? Uh, I don't know. I feel like I started off trying to find my parents' ice cream cart again, and mm. then that all melted and kind of went to shit. So I I kind of kind of feel like kind of feel like a, a man without a quest here. Um, but I think I know, you know, I, maybe I know. this new person can help us out. Yeah, I nod sagely and I push Gondelf away and I pull Jean Vieve, sorry, Genevieve Gazelle in. And I'm like, All right, all right, draft lady. I mean, <clears throat> All right, draft lady. Now, what's, we're in a bit of a pickle here and that you may call it an existential crisis, if you will. We don't even remember what we want out of life anymore. What is it you want more than anything? Well, I want all the money I can get from having a really well done consolidated business venture. I say, oh boy. Uh, wait, I was like a mix of the two voices. <laughs> 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 and I, I just kind of clear my throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, my friend, let me tell you, I think I'm getting out of the business world. It's no good for me. 
There's too many removed eyeballs and far too many arranged matches for my taste. Do you, uh, um, fuck. what's in front of us? Where, where are we headed right now? Like, <laughs> there you go. All right. So as you guys are discussing, you see the cave slowly coming into view here and uh, gone. The first thing you notice is your two parents sitting there. Uh -oh. Seemingly waiting for you. Uh oh. And they don't look particularly impressed either. Okay, I'm gonna immediately like go over to Angina and be like, "Dude, give me the dummy. <laughs> I, need to, I need to. I need to hide here." Uh, I hand her the dummy, and okay. uh, yeah, I hand her the dummy. Okay, I'm All gonna right. try and hide behind the cart and um, pretend I'm not there and only talk through the dummy. Perfect. Okay, so as the cart rolls up, these two tall, dignified-looking elves, or are you a half-elf? I don't remember anymore. Um, I... who's to say? Your non-distinct elf or not-elf parents mm -hmm. walk towards the cart, lean up against it, and hold up a very well-rendered uh, picture of your face and say... <laughs> Have you seen this person around? They uh, should have been selling Fairy Queen franchise products here. And I hold up the ventriloquist dummy and I go, Well, I don't know. I don't, th <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anyone that looks like that around these parts. <laughs> and um, after listening to what they said, I realized how to respond and I backed them up. Like, oh, yeah, sorry, no, can't help you there, ma'am and sir. All right. So. I give I give Genevieve like a good a nod, like, thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for covering for me. My parents are gonna kick my ass. <laughs> are your are your parents the owners of this company? Yeah. I, uh, I, so I realizing how much better even Gondelf is at my own character or my own uh, ventriloquist <laughs> dummy's voice. Um, uh, like a kind of look of resignation comes over my face. And uh, I, I, I decide to walk over to these parents and see if I can muster one last lie. Um, and uh, I, I kind of like grab them by the sides and like I pull them away from the cart and I say, Oh, are, are, are you the are you the the parents of that poor of that poor soul in the picture? And they go, um, yes. Have you uh, have you heard anything about them? I say, I'm afraid your son or daughter has died. There was there, you you may see in the the local news, the local scrawlings that there was a terrible raid by some terrible people, and uh, you know she was. She was living a, such a good life. She was betrothed to a local goblin king, and she she made so much money for your company. And it was all taken by those horrible adventures. And I I like force like a single tear out. Uh, and I'm I'm truly sorry for your loss. Just know that she died uh, serving your company's bottom line. <laughs> Comfort indeed to these parents. Yeah. Uh, one takes a step back and go, oh my goodness, we were coming here to fire them from the franchise because they haven't been bringing in profits for days now, but this explains so much. They seem so gung-ho about selling Fairy Queen ice cream to these adventurers. Oh, and they were, they were, in fact, they made record profits in that village, but, you know... Once they'd run out of village to pillage, those adventurers turned on us. And I kind of like describe what they look like to them and be like, just just send your, your corporate goons after them and you'll reclaim all your losses. But, you know, if I can be honest, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Delph, it seems that you're, you're missing a child. And I realize what I'm missing most in life is an opportunity at honest work. You see, I just... I spent my whole life lying and cheating and stealing and running around and and none of it brought me nothing. I I just I wish I could have had a mum and a dad. Just just like Gon used to talk about talk about how wonderful they were. That's the one thing I never had in life. And I kinda look at them with big puppy eyes and I'm like 
Will y'all take me in as your daughter? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to use your old psych roll. I'm even going to let you, uh, you roll your strongest staff for this one because you are, you are psychologically attacking these people. <laughs> oh, no, you misunderstand. I like what's happening is uh, I've, I've realized that like I'm not even a good con artist. <laughs> because I've done nothing but like make my situation worse since the beginning of this adventure. And the one thing I had going for me, which is my ventriloquist dummy, um, someone else is better at. <laughs> so I'm genuinely trying to give up my my life of crime and uh turn in your leaf. Yeah, yeah, well, because it turns out what I was longing for all along um was just some real human connection. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna roll psyche. Perfect, perfect. Oh, okay, I got a seven. Seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. They seem a little bit taken back by what appears to be genuine sincerity in wanting to change, but it happens so fast that they sort of just take a step back and they're like, well, uh, we can't, th they, they struggle for words for a second. We can't promise you any kind of familial relationship, but if you are looking for honest work, um, take our card here, and they uh, produce a card out of midair that says Fairy Queen, a uh, Delft division, and give it to you. Mm -hmm. It has contact info on where to send your nearest carrier pigeon to set up your own franchise. And they say, if you want to join the Fairy Queen family, you can contact us at this number, and we will we'll assist you the same way that we assist any of our franchise oh, franchise owners in setting up a cart we uh with the loss of our child's cart here we might need to set up a new operation here so having emotionally bared my soul and gotten like a business opportunity in response <laughs> um the facade starts to crack and my um it, i start to have an emotional meltdown and uh like i'm crying <laughs> and you know not well, I, I just say Oh, thank you, kind folks, because that's you know that's the that's the image I want to project for them. But I project my voice to the dummy, which is currently like sitting wherever Gandalf has it, and I say, "Oh wow, why I stuck a bunch of clowns? Can't even, can't even care taking a soul to love. Who wants them so badly? Wow, I'd be embarrassed if these were my parents. Oh lord." Um, but like. Uh, yeah, my lips aren't moving the whole time that happens. So, all right. So, the uh, the gentleman, Mister Delph, takes look at this uh, dummy and is like, "If you have something to say, say it to us directly." And he strives over to the cart, <clears throat> and as he's heading towards there, what's gone gonna do? Um. So I'm going to continue to try and hide i'm gonna like maybe like pull like more of a blanket over myself but like keep the ventriloquist dummy and i think i'm gonna try and deflect and i'm gonna say you know maybe i'm maybe i'm just projecting my own feelings on this whole situation and maybe i just don't know enough about the complex emotions of the people involved and <clears throat> i'm sure that just losing your only child must be a real hard situation for y'all and i uh I just, uh, I really feel for this young woman, and I would, I would totally, I totally feel like if you wanted to accept them as your child, that would be great, but also, like, it's totally understandable if you might be a little upset <laughs> from losing someone that seems to be very cherished to you. Um, peace, uh, uh, pay me no mind. <laughs> and then immediately after that, the dummy says, ah, I'm just kidding, you bunch of fools. Come at me. Come find me. <laughs> well, I'm having right. enough of you and your faces. Let's go. You and me, let's rumble. All right. So I'm going to have you guys roll opposing psych rolls here to see who's the better ventriloquist here. Oh, buddy, Ooh. you're going you're gonna to get lit up on my plus two yeah. psyche. Oh, boy. Uh, which which gives me a seven, or oh, sorry, an eight, an eight, an eight. Okay, I got a two. Oh. <laughs> so, without even stopping for a second, Mister Delf grabs the ventriloquist, and you're not quite able to move your arm in time, and you're pulled up, 
<laughs> and you're facing your father, right? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my worst dream. Oh, my worst nightmares are coming true. Um, <laughs> yeah, what up, old man? Is that all you got? That's what the ventriloquist dummy says. <laughs> and the, but then Angina says, Oh, Lord, everybody stop fun. I hate the fun. And then the endo says, Oh, come on, don't listen to her. She don't know nothing. She ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. Find me, old man. <laughs> Um, and I go, what, is John, what is Genevieve Gazelle doing all this? That's what I want. Yeah, that's what I'm actually wondering as well. Is this chaos is happening? Yeah, well, I'm just, uh, well, and the, the, uh, the, the little goblins that are also pulling the cart. We're just, um, we're, you know, I'm not sure if popcorn exists in this world, but we are essentially <laughs> just <laughs> you know, right. rhetorically. Well, it's probably a wise popcorn. decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, at the same time, like, you know, catching glances at them to make sure that, you know, that they are uh, not, uh, you know, not adding fuel to the fire, as they say, in the uh, heated <laughs> conversations. I don't think yeah. anyone who's been involved with this adventure so far at any point has had a good experience. So it's probably <laughs> for the best. You're probably the smartest person we've encountered. Mm -hmm. As if to sort of disentangle herself from... What appears to be a brawl happening, uh, Mrs. Delph actually makes her way towards you, watching as well, and she asks, uh, very politely for what appears to be the situation at the moment, she asks, and uh, what do you do? <laughs> uh, to me, right? <laughs> yes, just that sort of awkward, like, as everyone else is screaming, you're just sort of just like, uh, yeah, so how's the weather? <laughs> that sort of kind of thing. So okay. what, uh, what do you do? Well, ma'am... Um... I am a uh, food cart owner, and I sell burritos made, named after precious metals. And the specialty of my uh, little cart is called the golden guacamole. Also, man, did you know that I can draw perfect circles? So, like, every tortilla that I use for my burritos is a perfect circle? Yeah. Prove it, lady! Prove it! <laughs> <laughs> all right okay perfect so as that conversation is happening we're going to move over back to you're facing your father in the face right now and he facing, facing him in the face facing him in the face and mm -hmm. his face contorts to realize that not only is his daughter or son i actually don't know what your character is i've just been using they the entire time because i haven't been sure i i did not assign myself a gender so i've also been using they um, perfect that works for me inclusivity uh so as you look at their face contorts they realize that their child has not been dead they've been lied to by the child and all that rage of eventually wanting to kick your ass for their cart and product being missing all comes back all at once so and, yeah, okay go ahead. red what are you gonna do um i go oh hey dad um and i think and i'm like i go back through all my years of childhood and growing up in this like you know, business owning family. And I say the only thing that I know is going to diffuse the situation. And I say, hey, mom and dad, I have a business proposition for you. Um, I say, this woman over here that we just met today, her name is Genevieve. She owns a <clears throat> food cart that sells like burritos. She has so much salsa. We sell ice cream. I think that what we should do is put our carts together and start selling the two of them as one thing. People can get their, get their salsa, get something with a little bit of heat, something with a little bit of spice, and then they can get their ice cream, cool themselves off, have a nice refreshing cone. What do you think? I'll run it. You just have to, you guys, if you guys like pay for the initial overhead, I'll run it and I'll, it's gonna be a great business. What do you think? The vein in your father's temple appears to shrink just a little bit. <laughs> can I roll Psyche? You absolutely can. All right. Come on, Dad. <laughs> I got a nine. A nine. Okay. He seems intrigued. Intrigued enough to let go of you and look and say, turns over to Genevieve and says, is this the case? Are you looking for a partnership? Yes, absolutely. And I think that with the uh, desserts um, complimenting and, you know, satisfying our customers after they have one of my golden guacamoles, I think it would be a successful venture. All right. As if 
pulling again from nowhere, a pen and a checkbook appear in midair, and he begins to write out a amount of money that seems a lot higher than it probably should be, but he is excited for this opportunity to diversify as he's mumbling mumbo-jumbo about business. I've always been thinking that we need to diversify our interests. Ice cream might be a good dessert thing, but we could really push into that that mm -hmm. dinner and lunch menu as well. And really, we could upsell, we could upsell. He looks over to Angina and is like, would you be interested in becoming an employee of this new Fairy Queen Golden Guac business venture here? Uh, I kind of look down at my feet because I'm embarrassed at my, uh, well, I mean, I'm embarrassed that my attempted emotional vulnerability didn't work. Uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed that my uh, attempt at starting a fight didn't work. And I'm embarrassed that I got out ventriloquisted, uh, well, except for the last part. So um, I, I'm, I'm feeling very emotionally torn and I say, you know what, y'all? I think I just need some time to myself in the woods to figure myself out. And I kind of slowly start walking off, like into the into the sunset. And then I get just far enough away that it's awkward. Turn around and come back for Endo the uh, <laughs> my my ventriloquist dummy. And then I like quietly grab without saying anything and wander off into the forest. Okay. Um, look, turning to Genevieve here. Uh, Mr. Delf goes, well, this, uh, this amount right here should, uh, cover any expenses about, uh, expanding your cart a little bit as well as ingredients, uh, and producing another card with just a snap of his fingers. He hands it over to Genevieve and says, if you have any questions or any need for monetary, uh, overhead expense covering anything just just let me know he's he is getting more and more amped up as he thinks about this business venture and then looks to his child and goes this might be the best idea you've had since moving out of our house then i pick up the check and look at it and i was blown away by the amount of money mm -hmm. and one of the little goblins that were still holding up the cart um hops onto my shoulder and looks over and says, you can buy a lot of new silverware with this. <laughs> like, oh, that is so true. <laughs> it sure is. And finally, the Mr. Delph with a, a booming voice that seems to just carry through the woods, he goes, and Miss Angina, for bringing us together with all this, we would be more than happy to maybe consider having you over at Thanksgiving every year. Uh, I've wandered into the wish, into the woods, into the woods to the point that I can only just barely hear them. And they hear like a faint echoing so faint. You're not sure that you can actually hear it, but it sounds a lot like, Oh, bite me old man. And then that's all you ever hear from that China ever again. <laughs> all right. So, with that, I think we can finally bring an end to this full circle that we've brought from a cave to another cave and back again. So Perfect. our little epilogue right here. Oh wait, was that too early? No, no, it's all good, it's all good. I can- No, you I can read the epilogue, epilogue, it's fine. Yeah, okay, so uh, Angina, after leaving emotionally vulnerable learned that you can't trust anyone in this business and returns to her old ways of scamming, bullshit, and dishonest work. However, due to this painful emotional scar she carries for the rest of her life from being vulnerable and getting it spit back, she's actually better at it now. But before too long, I'm sure she'll find herself in trouble with the law again and trying to stay low with honest work. But at least she has a card she knows she can call at this point. The Fairy Queen and Golden Guac, patent pending, uh, joint venture does very well for itself based on the ability to upsell ice cream after eating one of the super spicy burritos with a side of Golden Guac. Toot toot. Uh, as such, a Gondelf does not feel the need to actually go back to university. They're becoming 
a venture capitalist. Mm. Uh oh. Hell yeah. And Genevieve, <laughs> paying her employees a fair wage and only working them 40 hour weeks, uh, gets to the point where she actually becomes an equal partner in the Fairy Queen business. And when Mr. Delph decides to retire, decides to make you the CFO of the entire organization. Hey, woo. And that is where you can play the final music, Kelly. I know what you're talking about. Oh no, we got a purple heart. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, troubling. Thanks for the game, everybody. I'm glad we were finally able to bring this to a close. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for yeah, thanks for GMing. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. You've all been excellent. Every player who's been across the entire what month and a half I've been doing this on and off, two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all been while. great. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all, and I yeah. will uh, now uh, bring it back to you and Kelly to sort of see what you guys have to finish this off with. Yeah, actually, Josh, did you have you had a uh, gaming uh, fundraising thing coming up? Did you want to plug that again? Uh, yes, I don't actually have a link for it yet, but basically, when there's um, a general website that people use called Extra Life that you can make small groups with and stream games. We usually do a 24 hour stream, me and a couple of their friends, eight hours a piece, and you'll be able to donate at uh, the URL whenever we actually make our group again. Um, it'll be eight hours a piece. You'll be able to see us do a five, wide variety of games. And yeah, so if you're bored at any hour of the night on it's sometime in November. I'll try to get more details if I come on here before the time. But mm -hmm. we're always looking for donations. My money goes towards the Stollery Children's Hospital in here in Edmonton. So, you know, every penny helps and it goes towards a good cause. So, yes, mm -hmm. check it out or just check out Extra Life in general because there's usually good stuff going on across the board in mm -hmm. every city. So, yes, that's my tag. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, make sure you post that in the Discord group whenever it gets closer to absolutely cool um giselle did you have anything you wanted to plug and my campaign's fine right yeah of course yeah sounds good so yes i'm running for um, edmonton city council for ward cp with Nawak. i'm a first time candidate and quite yes i'll be frank i'm a challenger and um i really wanted to have more everyday representation of everyday edmontonians at council which is why i'm running my website is giselgeneral.ca and i am very active in all of the social media channels so facebook twitter linkedin instagram and TikTok. so you can um get in touch with me uh, again, this is maybe like the immigrant in me again. Like, please, Canadians, let's bump up our voter turnout. I am blown away that voter turnout for municipal is 30%. I, it's it probably a rant for another day, but please, um, it's, I'm, again, I'm speaking from an immigrant here. It's so convenient to vote here in Canada. It's so safe and your vote really matters. So please, please vote. Um, advanced um, voting is uh, next week, starting from October 4th to 13th, including Thanksgiving and uh, election day is October 18th. So please vote for your new mayor, city councilor and school board trustees. Okay. Thanks. Okay. You bet. Did you want to, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's very important. That's all your stuff. Did you want to plug your uh, partner or your husband's gaming stream? Is that a thing? Uh, no. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to. Yeah, it's his own thing. So um, uh -oh. maybe you'll stumble upon him on Twitch. So, you know, have okay. fun, have fun looking for him because I, I photobomb the webcam sometimes, which apparently the <laughs> audience likes. So maybe I'll just randomly see B or him on Twitch. So I'll, I'll let you, exp I'll let you like do some hunting and find him. Deal. Yeah. How long can it take to check out everyone's stream on Twitch until I find that? <laughs> <laughs> There's not that many people on Twitch, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a small website. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Thanks for, and I wanted to say too, thanks for uh, sharing some of your story with us, Genevieve. I know you said it's, you know, uh, can be emotionally taxing. So I appreciate you opening up a bit about that. Um, oh, and your blog as well. Do you have a um, link to your blog that we can check out? Yeah, absolutely. I had to like modify it just because of the election. Uh, but uh, the blog is filipinayeg.com. 
so I should be able to like launch or make the content all accessible again after election day. And okay. another plug that I want to add in, there is an ethnic paper here in the city called Alberta Filipino Journal. So if you ended up going shopping to Filipino stores here in the city, grab some snacks. Um, there's a free version of the paper and you can also read it online. Most of the content is in English. So, um, you know, and a couple columns in Tagalog, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to learn about what's happening in the country and in the city with a bit of a Filipino lens and because it's for a Filipino audience, you might find it uh, valuable to uh, to expand your um, your references for um, learning about the community. So okay. that's Alberta Filipino Journal. Alberta Filipino Journal, perfect. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Giselle. Um, Kelly, did you have anything you wanted to say before we sign off? Well, I don't know, we're a little over time. Do we have time for an anecdote, Nicole? Oh boy, can you give us the brief producer? version? <laughs> yeah, so the brief version is, uh, it's just funny because as you know, I did graduate from clown college and uh, a whole big chunk of my graduating class died in a horrific plane crash. And I, you know, we, we all wanted to, you know, have a big funeral, but we kind of couldn't because of COVID. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a real challenge trying to figure out how we could do kind of like a Zoom-based memorial so that the survivors could uh, mourn other dunces. <laughs>